All right. Super. I got all dressed up for you. I can see that. <laughs> uh, as did many of our students here, as yeah. you may be able to see too. So uh, we are in the classroom here. And again, this is uh, Lincoln Christian University. We're in Lincoln, right. Illinois. So right in the middle of the state. Um, we have, uh, this is my junior marketing class, Marketing 2. Okay. And uh, we've got a couple of other guests here, some staff and some other colleagues. Uh, my 14-year-old daughter is here too because she read Johnny Bunko. Okay. Good. And um, let's see. Well, uh, as you and I emailed last week, we'll just go ahead and uh, give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about what you're doing and field some questions from the students. And we'll do that. Yeah, no, I'm, mo I'm mostly interested in hearing from the students. I mean, okay. um, you know, I know that some of them have read some of the books. And so I'm always interested in hearing sort of what I left out, what I got wrong, uh, what they think of it, where they think the arguments are weak. And so if you'd like, you know, just fire away. And if you want to go beyond the scope of the book to talk about other stuff, I'm totally game. Okay, super. Uh, well, why don't we go ahead and do that? These, these students have all read uh, To Sell as Human. Sell. Right? Yeah. And... Uh, We've read this semester, they've also read Cialdini's uh, influence as well, so they're familiar Great. with that material. Um, so let's, uh, let's start. Anything you guys want to talk about, okay? The floor is open, and we've got a mic here, and we can wander around. And I'll even leave it uh, op open to our guests as well, if there's anything anybody wants to ask about. I, know if, if, I mean, Michael, if you want, I mean, I can talk a little bit about how I came to write the book just to, you know, open the curtain a little bit here, if, sure. you, if you want me to do that. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, here's, so I'll give you the sort of the, the idea here, and this, and this Skype conversation makes sense. I think in the old days, there was this view, especially among writers, that writers were sort of like in a different category from regular civilian human beings. Uh, that they sort of stood on a mountaintop and they dispatched their writing down to the valley and the grateful people in the valley would take that and, oh, this is so fantastic. And I think that world ended years and years ago and that, you know, generating ideas and writing books as a vessel for generating ideas is very much a conversation um, between the, the person generating the ideas and the recipients, the, the readers or the listeners. And I think in the process of that conversation, the ideas actually get stronger and the ideas get deeper. Um, and I think that's really, really important. And I think it's, you know, I think a lot of writers don't like that. And I was a little uneasy with it at the beginning, but I think that's really the case. And, and I say that because it's an example of what we're doing today, but it's also an example of how I got to write each of these books. So, um, so I'll give you an example of, of this one, To Sell is Human. How did I get to write this book? Well, one of them, as I, one reason, as I describe in the book itself, is that I started looking at my own schedule and my own calendar, trying to figure out how the heck I spent my own time, um, which was kind of a mystery to me. And I'm sitting here, I mean, you know, you get a little window into my office. This is my office. Uh, little window into my office here. Uh, over here is, can you, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see my bobblehead collection up there? Sure. Yep. Right over. How am I doing this? Yep. Right there. <laughs> um, and um, that's a window. And um, this is the garage. This is the garage behind my. I, I live right there. I, I, I live right there. Okay. Uh, and um, and so when you you know so you're sitting in so, so sitting by yourself in an office isn't really the best way to really connect and get ideas and and have fresh notions. Sure. So one of the things that I've done since the since the very beginning is on my very first book is that I've, I've always put my email address or contact information on the book so people on the book so people can send me email and I get a lot of email from readers. Um, that's a pain in the neck sometimes, but other times it's actually really useful. And one of the things that happened uh, a few years ago was this: I wrote a book called Drive. And that book is, an, is about the science of motivation. And that book makes an argument about this. That book looks at about 50 years of social science on um, human motivation. And what it says is this, um, that there's a certain kind of reward that we use in organizations. I call it an if-then reward, as in if you do this, then you get that. Mm -hmm. And what the research shows pretty clearly is that if-then rewards are very effective for simple, mechanical, algorithmic tasks with short time horizons. Right. Turning the same screw the same way on an assembly line, adding up columns of figures, if-then rewards work really, really well. We like rewards. You dangle it in front of somebody, you get their attention in a very, very focused way. Mm -hmm. But the same body of research tells us that if-then rewards 
are not very effective at all for more complex creative work with longer time horizons. They just they get people to focus when you need to be expansive. They burn people burn through them really quickly. They tend to narrow your vision when you want to widen it. They lead to some bad behavior, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, what we need is that we need you know it's totally fine to use if then rewards for certain kinds of things. But the vast majority of things that people are doing on the job, certainly what you will be doing on the job when you get graduate and, and, and we hope get a job, is um, is more complex things, and we see need a different kind of motivational mechanism for those. Okay, so that's basically what that book is about. So that book has the email address on the on the cover, and people say, oh, and, and immediately I start getting email, and one among the first communications I got was, oh, oh okay, what about sales? Mm-hmm. You think about how do we compensate salespeople? Classic if then reward, sales commissions. If you sell, then you make money. If you don't sell, then you hit the bricks. Mm-hmm. Good question. Um, and at the same time, I mean, literally in that very first week that book came out, I started hearing from companies who said, wow, this is kind of freaky because you're describing this weird thing that I did or you're helping me understand this weird thing that I did that was unorthodox and should not have worked but actually did. What I did, Dan, they would say in the email, is I eliminated commissions for salespeople and saw sales go up. Whoa. Whoa. That's totally weird. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it wasn't just one company. It was several. And so that got me really wondering. And I realized in about 20 years of writing, almost 20 years of writing about business, I'd never written anything about sales. So I started looking into it. And I started thinking about my own behavior. And I said, wait a second. This is a pretty important topic that hasn't been treated in a very serious way. And then as I got further into it, I said, wait a second. This is an area that has changed considerably over the last uh, 10 years. I mean, really changed more in the last 10 years than in the previous 100, as I say in, in the book. And so, um, and I realized that what salespeople were doing was really tough, uh, really complex, really intellectually sophisticated in many cases, wasn't what most people thought they were doing. And so uh, I said, let's write a book about sales for people who might not read a book about sales. Mm-hmm. And, but, the, but the impetus of it was really this idea of a conversation between writer and reader. And people saying, what about this? What about that? And that was really, when one of the, along with my own behavior, was one of the sparks for getting me to explore this, uh, to explore this topic. And so the point of all that is like, you know, that's the backstory. So, you know, a lot of times if you end up talking to someone who's a writer who has the same approach that I do, you know, you could actually have a real influence on what kind of books come out. So, um, so that's the backstory of that. And I wrote the book, as you know, as a mix of, a reporting, you know, going out and interviewing people, spending time with them, as well as uh, social science, because there's some really, really cool social science on, on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in many ways, um, you know, this book stands on the shoulders of Robert Cialdini's, Bob Cialdini's influence, which is just a great, great, you know, really, really important book. Right. And so, you know, what I was trying to look at is, you know, the world has changed considerably since that book came out, particularly these this rebalancing of information or this refashioning of information from information asymmetry to information parity right. and that's a huge huge deal and um and i and so what i wanted to do was try to understand how do you how does one become persuasive influential how does one sell ideas products services yourself uh in a world where in the information is evenly matched and so that's what i uh that's what i tried to do the other thing and i'll shut up here in a moment um the other thing that I try to do in the books, and just in terms of the way that I structure them, the way that I, the, the, sort of the architecture of them is this. And this comes from my frustration as a reader more than anything else. So there's some books out there that will give you, that are sort of big idea books. They'll tell you, the world is changing, it's going this way, you better watch out, blah, 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 you know, big idea books. And um, they, they're sometimes very persuasive, and you, but you end them and you're, and you're like, whoa, wait a second, I'm convinced the world is changing, mm-hmm. but then they don't bother to tell you to do anything about it. Oh, that's not my problem, you know? And then there are other books that are more kind of self-help books that tell you you should do all these things, and you're like, well, how do you know? Uh, and so what I try to do is, is marry the two. So a book about ideas, a book that makes big arguments um, based on data, based on sophisticated trends, a big idea book, but also like, try to give people some things they can do right. so they can you know, survive, in that in that new world, so that's one of the things that I've tried to do in in um, in in all of my books. So I will stop there and take some of your wise and insightful questions. Let me before we do that, let me just say that that's something that I've appreciated about the books from 
a whole new mind and to drive and to, and to, to sell as humans. They all have that very similar structure of here's the way the world was, here's how it's changing, now here's what to do about it. And right. really enjoy that format. I think that works Thanks. really well. Okay. Uh, students, maybe want to ask a question, share a thought. Throw up your hand, we'll get a microphone around. All right, I'll ask a question. Go ahead. So having read the book, or having supposed to have read the book, um, <laughs> what um, is there one thing, just one thing, that you might do differently in your own life because of the book? A different way to persuade people, a different technique you might use. Is there one thing that you might do differently based on having read the book? Throw up a hand, anybody. Because if you don't, you'll really hurt my feelings. Uh, one thing I do differently is uh, the fact that the understanding that people may know more information than I actually do, like how the how selling how selling to people is completely different now. Um, mm -hmm. How we used to tell them about the product, but now um, they may know may, may know more about the product than I do. So becoming a more relational basis is probably one of the biggest things that um, I've come out of selling and being able to understand people that way. So Interesting. Okay, that's good. All right. And, and what about, does it, change, does it change at all the way that um, you approach the information? Does it change the way, do you feel, oh, I have to be even more of an expert now? Uh, yeah, to a little bit it does. Um, it helps me... Um, know that I can't really uh, make up any, any information just so I can get the sale. Right. Um, that's, that's one of the big things. And also, um, it helps me understand that the relationship is the biggest point that gets them to trust you, and you have to find that trust right away. So yeah. that's one of the biggest things that um, – because I, I grew up with sales. My dad was a um, home improvement guy, and I had to go around and help him sell things. And usually I, was, usually I was the expert telling the people the information, but now it's completely changed because they have internet and they can research everything to right. the max. So right. that's something I found really, um, really important to help me change yeah. the way I think. Oh, that's cool. I think uh, one thing I saw I'd do differently is the idea with buoyancy, how you yeah. talked about um, the before is asking questions and asking like yourself, can you do it instead of rather saying you yeah, can do it. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that one too. I think that that's an awesome idea because um, too many people will say they can do it. But if when you ask yourself questions, you, you can make a list for yourself and say, this is why I'm go this is why I can do it. Or by, and even by asking those questions, you're also opening the door to uh, finding ideas, well, this could be a, an obstacle, but answering that question beforehand will help you overcome it. And also the whole staying positive with three to one ratio, because I mean, you're always going to have um, people who are going to say no way more than yes. And it's just kind of accepting that idea of rejection and kind of embracing that. And also just not taking things personal. Um, it's all temporary, specific, and external. So I think that's something that would yeah. help me a lot as not taking it personally and just kind of pushing forward. Yeah, you make a good point on the on the interrogative self-talk, the can you do it self-talk, because a lot of times um, it's, it's a little, it also operates, and I don't think I wrote well enough about this aspect of it that you're mentioning, but a lot of times the can you do this operates as a reality check, uh, because a lot of times people say, you know, you can do this, you got this, and they actually can't. Um, and so they're overconfident, they're delusional, and uh, that presents a big problem, particularly for uh, men. Men are much more likely to do that than women, to be delusionally overconfident. Um, and this is a way to you know, mitigate that a little bit, um, especially among us delusionally overconfident men. So what other questions? I mean, I'm happy to take questions, too. I don't want everyone to have to testify to how awesome the book is. But let's, um, um, what are some questions you might have? Well, actually, I have one more testimony to give real quick. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, I am actually a psychology major, and uh -huh. um, I mean, this book basically confirms already, you know, how to live in the everyday world versus just in the counseling side of it. Because oh, 
everything is confirmed already with the counseling side. Obviously, when you speak to someone, it is a matter of seeing their side of things and yeah. things like that. But when it comes in the workforce and how you deal with others outside, um, I was a little skeptical in the beginning because I felt, you know, p since people know I'm a psychology major, they always think that I'm trying to like get into their head. But this mm -hmm. kind of allows that opportunity to present itself and allowing it to be OK. So if anything, this was just good for me to see that and read about it so I can continually apply that to others. So cool. That's good. What did you think of the um, have you learned in your psychology, your counseling classes uh, about motivational interviewing? A little, not yeah. so much yet, but um, as I continue further, I, I have, yeah. I will, I mean. Is that, that, that's a technique from the book that a lot of people find really interesting, this idea of, you know, um, uh, on a scale of zero to t one to ten, how likely are, are, you know, how ready are you to do something, and then, I can't remember what page it's on, uh, but it's a part about asking two irrational questions, mm -hmm. and um, it's a takeaway about asking two irrational questions. The first one is, on a scale of one to ten, how ready are you to do something? And most people aren't ready to do it, so let's say a two. Mm -hmm. And then the follow-up question is, why did you pick a lower number? Right. And they have to defend why they're not a one. And that, and then, and in doing that, they begin to surface their own reasons for doing something, their, their own autonomous, intrinsically motivated reasons for taking action. Yeah, I remember that. So, um, yeah, it's a good. Uh, yeah, and I think that you know people trained in counseling know that really well. It's very, you know, they know how to do that. I think the rest of us. Are kind of clueless, mm -hmm. so we could borrow some of those techniques from 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 counseling. Well, let me confirm it is correct. So, <laughs> oh, so oh, so relieved. All right. Okay. All right. Somebody else. Oh. She's just my teaching assistant. I'm ignoring over here. <laughs> um, Landon brought up. Uh, buoyancy and I was just wondering that since you've become you know like basically you know you've become an author and you're popular and everything do you still have to deal with like people telling you no and if you do like how do you deal with that now compared to when you first started out that's a good question uh, on the first so the, the question is do I have to still deal with people saying no and um, the second part is how do you deal with that compared to earlier in your trajectory is that it that's the question yes yeah. Okay. So on the first part, do I uh, do I have to hear? Do I do I hear? Do I ever hear no? Let me think about that. Hmm. Every freaking day. <laughs> uh, um, absolutely. There's a there's there's a world of no's out there, and you have to be able to to deal with it. Now, I think it's a very insightful. The second part is a very insightful question. Is you know, have I seen any changes in myself and how I deal with that? And um, I, I think. Um, Yes, the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. Uh, part of it is just kind of habit and experience, but part of it is actually understanding. So uh, one of the things that I do is that I, um, I I take it way less personally. I mean, amazingly less personally. I, like I don't take anything personally, um, and I think that ends up being a you know, a really important trait in general. I, I think you can go beyond that and say that, you know, if ultimately you don't care what other people think, I mean, not in a sociopathic way, but, you know, you don't, if you don't care what other people, you know, you care about what the people who you love think, but, but in like, if somebody thinks like, I don't like your, 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 your t-shirt or boy, I didn't like that article. I mean, you take it seriously because it's a form of feedback, but Ultimately, you know, you don't let it get you down. And so taking it far less personally is, is really important. And, but that's like, you know, that's like building up a muscle. That's not something we do instinctively. It's, you know, we um, and so I think that time has helped me do that a little bit better. I still don't like it. Like if somebody goes on, you know, I mean, if I get a bad review, for instance, and, every, you know, every writer gets bad reviews. I've gotten many bad reviews. Um, um, you don't like it, but you don't, you know. Um, so in the old days, I might have stewed over it for two weeks, and now I stew over it for two hours, something like that. So, but I still bother, it still bothers me. It bothers me less. I take it less personally. I do think that the research that Landon mentioned about from Martin Seligman on the personal, pervasive, and permanent idea, that explanatory style, I've used that myself, and I find it really, really, I find it really effective. 
I find it really effective, especially when you're sort of, you know, you get hit with a rejection of some kind and you're like, okay, was this entirely personal? And chances are it wasn't. I mean, at some level, things aren't personal, aren't entirely personal because people don't care that much about you. You know, like they're making decisions for other reasons besides evaluating you. Uh, is it pervasive? No, it doesn't always happen. And the third one on permanent, is it going to ruin everything? It's not. Most things don't ruin everything. So I think that, exp so that explanatory. So to answer your question, I mean, I've gotten a lot better at it over time, partly through experience and just, you know, the kind of toughening that comes through experience. But also, I mean, I think that I, I personally have been really helped by that research on explanatory style, and I, and I do use it. I have a question more kind of on the marketing side of things, um, kind of being in and around the marketing field. Uh, what are some obstacles that you have faced that you've never expected to occur or happen? In marketing the, the books or the ideas? or Yeah, in marketing yeah. the books and just in the field in general. Yeah. Um, I don't think that the obstacles that I've faced are really that unique. I, I think that um, one of them is, is that it's very, very noisy out there. And there's a lot of claims on people's attention, uh, just so many of them. And that's just a challenge. And that's just how the landscape works today. So that's been, I think, a really big, I think that's been a really big challenge. Um, the other thing is, and I, I've gotten better at this, um, but I think a lot of folks don't quite realize this. And I don't think I realized it at the beginning, is that I really think that marketing today goes back to that conversation. And... It, it's something that builds over time. That is, you know, there's a, te there's a tendency to think that, um, let's take books, let's be very specific. You know, the, the conventional view in, in a lot of books is that what you should do is that you should try to get your, your book on TV as much as possible the first week. And so if you go to that white hot center when the first book is out and you're on TV a lot, you're going to have a big success. And the truth is, is that if you get on TV a lot your first week, you'll sell a lot of copies your first week. But it doesn't say anything what you're going to be selling your third week. And, in, you know, and if you're in it for the long haul, you have a very different approach. So I've very slowly built up, um, for instance, an email newsletter. Uh, I don't advertise on it. I don't talk about my own stuff very, very often on there. I just have people opt in and try to serve them. And, you know, I mean, I, you know, we don't have a, it's not a huge list. We have maybe 75,000 right now. Um, but at some point we had zero. Okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, we didn't get the 75,000 in one night. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a tendency to think about, to look for quick fixes when it comes to marketing. When in fact it's go out and find the people you want to have a conversation with, treat them exceptionally well, be very transparent, be very open, be very service oriented. And that's really the approach. But, um, and I think a lot of people get frustrated because they want to take, they want to do it quickly. They want the instant um, results, and it, it just doesn't work that way anymore. Yeah, and I think that's another, that just reminded me of another thing that you wrote in the book about about the whole conversation. It's that's really I, th I found that really valuable for me because I think too many times it's focused on trying to sell. No one likes somebody that's pushy. But no. When you have that conversation going, you when you have a conversation with somebody, you bring up values that you both share, and through that they'll be able to see. What your val what you're selling is your value. So I thought that was uh, something that was really well that I learned. And you have to have patience. And I think good salespeople have always known this: that if I treat you well, you might not buy from me right away, but maybe you'll buy from me next time. And you know, if I you know, and if I do something that's valuable, you might not go for me right away, but maybe you'll go for me next time. And if you know, and if if I treat you well, you say, hey, listen, I didn't buy from the guy, but he's you know, he treated me well. He was totally fair. He was honest. He was transparent. He um, you know, uh, he he provided some insights to me. And you might tell other people that. And I think the big change though is that is how quickly people can tell that kind of stuff to others. It isn't simply that you go to your backyard and lean over your fence and tell your neighbor. I mean, you could do it right, I mean, literally right now. You could take out your phone and tell everybody on, on um, you know, all your face. I mean, literally right now, if I were to say something, you know, stupid or, or, or offensive or anything like that, right now you could go on your phone and tell hundreds of people, that guy Dan Pink is a real weasel. 
And, and you could, you know, and if a few of you did it, that'd be like several hundred people all of a sudden think that I'm, a, you know, hear that I'm a weasel. That's a big difference from Landon going home, maybe having a barbecue next week and saying to one dude, hey, I met this guy, Dan Pink, he's a real weasel. And so, um, and so what I think that does, and I think it's a really important part of marketing, is that it forces all of us as marketers, as people who care about ideas, uh, to, the, to the high road. You don't take the low road today. Um, not only is it the wrong thing to do uh, morally, but it's also just not effective. All right, going to go to the back here with Ben. Okay, so so the first person that talked to you, Scotty, talked to you about relationships and sales and how his dad was in that. I also kind of want to go into sales. I'm looking to do an internship with Harley, Harley Davidson this summer, and I part of it would be sales. And I know a guy who's the top salesman at his place, and the reason why he is good is because he sent like he calls people on their birthday, he sends them anniversary cards, he he does all these things to build up that relationship. And earlier you also asked about the expert. Do you think that you need to be more of an expert because of this? And he told me that I should be more of an expert because I kind of talked to him about this because it builds up that authenticity and then that builds towards the relationship. But my question is, with the drastic change in like the past 10 years in sales, do you think that uh, like he, everybody on Harley at sales is on commission, do you think that they're also like the whole dynamic of that is going to go away? And do you think that sales is going to change again really fast as well? Yeah. So that's so, so that's a lot of questions. A lot of and a, but a lot of really really yeah. good questions. Let I'm me, sorry uh, about that. That's cool. That's cool. Um, uh, let me go to um, the point about um, I think the two sort of big ideas in your question. One of them is um, it has to do with with being an expert. Absolutely. I think there is such a premium and expertise right now. Uh, be, partly because, as you guys all know, and as I've written about, it's easy for civilians, people who don't, it's easy to get information about something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so I could, if I was in the, in, interested in a motorcycle, okay, uh, I could, you know, get off this Skype call and spend 20 minutes because that's a big purchase, right? So I'm going to want to do some research for a big purchase like that. I could spend a half an hour um, putting together some pretty good research on what to look for in a motorcycle, right? Um, that's just a half an hour. For something that big, I'm going to spend more time on it. I might go to my Facebook um, friends or to Twitter. Hey, who knows about my motorcycles? What should I look for? What should I avoid? And so when I get to that Harley dealership, um, I'm already reasonably well-informed. I'm not an expert, but I'm reasonably well-informed. And so I don't want to talk to someone else who's reasonably well-informed. I want to talk to someone who's a genuine expert. I want to talk to someone who says, I've been riding Harleys for 25 years. I've seen this make and that make, and here's the difference between this and that. And for a first-time rider, this is what you should be looking for. And there's certain things that aren't going to be right for you because you've never been on a motorcycle before. And, you know, I want real expertise there. Uh, I don't want him to tell me we have three models or four models. I already know that from the website. I want him to look at me and say, all right, based on your, based on my expertise, here's the, the motorcycle that I would recommend to you at this time. And so, so expertise matters considerably, considerably. And you look at a brand like Harley, you know, as I think a good example of this, you know, I, I asked, let me Take a step back here. I asked a lot of salespeople in the course of interviewing for this book, are there some people who are could sell anything? I mean, they have this idiotic phrase, could sell ice to Eskimos. You know, so you can go from selling Harleys to selling women's undergarments to selling wholesale seafood, whatever. And every single successful salespeople said, person said, no, you can't. Um, because there's such a premium and expertise now that you actually have to know something and care about what you're selling. And so Harley is a great example. Someone who doesn't love Harleys is going to be a terrible Harley salesperson. Someone who loves Harleys is going to be really good at it because she's going to develop expertise. She's going to know the insides and outs. She's going to care about it. She's going to convey her enthusiasm for it. So that's really, really important is, is expertise that comes from being genuinely interested in what you're selling. This is why, like, for, especially for those kinds of brands, that the – you know, it makes sense for to look for your sales force among your most dedicated users. 
um, rather than take someone who says, oh, I sold Toyotas yesterday so I can sell Harleys today. Um, and so, so that's one thing. So expertise, yes, 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 yes. Commissions, good question. Um, I don't think there's a uniform answer to that. What I want people to do is, is question the orthodoxy that that's the only way you can motivate a sales force. Because I don't think that's the case. And there are, you know, so I just want them to question the orthodoxy. What I would be interested in is if Harley took a different approach. Uh, imagine if Harley did a, that dealership did, uh, you know, I don't know whether it would work, but it'd be interesting to test. Let's say Harley spent a couple of months, you know, a few months, and they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pay people very, you know, reasonably healthy base salaries, our sales force. And then we're going to, um, then we're going to compensate people based on that high base salary and then a total share of the profits that we've made. I think what you'd see there is you might have more collaboration. Um, you know, why should I help you sell a Harley when I don't get anything for it? You know, if you're individually commissioned, why should I help you sell? Maybe I should try to poach that customer from you. Um, and, you know, if everybody's working together, then it might be better for the company, might be better for the customer. Not always. So my, my view on commissions is that we just need to challenge the orthodoxy. My, my guess is that you know, many, many places with the sales force haven't even considered doing it another way. And my view is consider doing it another way. It doesn't mean you have to do it, but at least put it on your menu of options. And also experiment. I mean, just test stuff. Um, you know, I, and I think it's going to vary. I think it's going to vary from product to product. It's going to vary from... Uh, it's going to vary from customer to it's going to vary from customer to customer. Let me throw out a question here, Dan. Um, we've talked a lot about the book uh, earlier in the semester, the various principles, attunement, buoyancy, clarity, pitch, improvise, serve. What have you learned um, about sales since writing the book that maybe you would throw into a revised edition or an appendix or something? Yeah. Um, a, a few things. Number one is that um, the resistance to the word sales is even more ferocious than I expected, mm -hmm. uh, especially among people who aren't in sales. They really don't like this, and there's a, there's a little bit more of a uh, of a of a hurdle to overcome than I would have expected. I would still bicycle up that mountain, absolutely, but I might you know pack a few more power bars or something for the mm -hmm. journey. Um, um, you know, there's, uh, so I, I think that's, that, that, I think that was one of the big, um, one of the big takeaways. Um, the other, um, the, I mean, the, among the other things that I've learned is, I mean, I guess there's, there's just so much research now in, um, the idea of like giving, I, I guess the, at, at a big, big level, I wish I'd made a sharper point of this is that. And, it, and it's tied to the motivation book too. Is that one of the guys in the motivation? One of the motivation researchers I write about in the book Drive is a guy named Edward Deasy. He's at the University of Rochester, mm -hmm. and he says something in that book. Said something to me, and I put in the book that's I think really powerful. He said, "You know, we got to get past this idea that motivation is something that one person does to another, uh, and really understand that motivation is something that people do for themselves." And I think the same thing is true with selling, persuasion, and influence, that we got to get past the notion that it's something that you know, I do to you, but it's basically, instead, it's like, I understand you well enough, I set the context well enough, that you make your own decisions to do something. And when people have their own reasons for doing something, they believe those reasons more deeply and adhere to them more strongly. And so um, I wish I had made a better, I wish I, wish I had made a, a stronger point of, I wish I had made a stronger point of of that um, of that as well. Okay. You've done a lot to develop the drive and motivation material. You've got the workshops and the training you do with that. Um, any similar plans to do something along the lines of a whole new mind or with to sell as human? Do you maybe. see those developing in that kind of way? Maybe, maybe. Um, you know, it's an experiment trying to, you know, can you take this basket of ideas and make it work in another context? It ends up being pretty challenging. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, my view is, you know, let's, we're still iterating on those workshops. We're still trying to make them really awesome and amazing. And so, you know, I want to get that right first before moving on. But I think it's an important question to ask about, you know, what is the best way to get ideas? What is the best way to get ideas 
it's out there. And I, I, it calls for, again, to me, it calls for a lot of experiments. I like that idea. Experiments, projects. Yeah. You just, I mean, I, I really think there's a case for just like try stuff and see what works. Yep. Yep. Um, and if it doesn't work, stop doing it. And if it does work, try to figure out why and do it a little bit more. Sure. Uh, um, you know, because I think a lot of these questions that we have, I mean, you can go to the theory, this is going to work because of X, this is not going to work because of Y. But, you know, I think, I think you try it out. I mean, I think to the question, you know, I think it's true about sales commissions. Um, I actually have a hunch that, you know, if Harley were like, if, if Harley were to, to, to try a different kind of compensation system that wasn't individual commissions, they could end up doing better. Um, I think there's also a chance I could be wrong. Um, sure. But, you know, so I think that's, I mean, I think it's worth, I think it's worth testing, you know, I think it's worth testing. I think it's worth testing that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Another question? All right. Hey, Dan. Uh, my name is Rob. I'm uh, one of the other professors here, and I teach intercultural studies. And uh, I did a, a lot of your, a lot of the stuff you do in A Whole New Mind, I tried to incorporate into curriculum design uh, with the idea that the, the combination of information and empathy and story and all that other stuff. And it's been really, really effective in conjunction with, uh, I don't know if you've seen the book by D. Fink about significant learning. No, I don't know that book. In, in any case, it's been really exciting to see kind of how that's, that's worked out. Here's my question. Lots of my students connect well with that approach and, and find good things in that. But in the end, their courage kind of falters when they realize after college they've got to make some pretty big steps. Um, is there something, I mean, besides Johnny Bunko about this courage piece at this particular age that as professors we could do or, or be a part of to help with that? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I don't have a great answer for you. I, mean, I think it's a very, I think that the, uh, you, you put it better than, than I have. Um, I've seen glimmers of that myself, this kind of lack of courage, this lack of gumption, um, and how do you and how to address it? I think is I, I, how to address it. I think is challenging. Um, let me. I can offer a few small ideas. I don't know. Again, test them and see whether they're right. I, I, you know, they're, they're barely even rise to the level of ideas. I mean, they're just sort of you know brain burps more than anything else. Um, but I mean, one of them is as, as simple minded as it sounds is to model that behavior. Um, that if you want people who you're working with who are looking to you to be courageous, then you have to be courageous yourself. You have to do things that show courage because if you're saying go out there and be courageous and they look at you, I don't mean you, Rob, but I mean, you know, you look at like the instructor or the authority figure and that authority or instructed that, that authority or an, an instructor is not being courageous himself. They're like, well, this is nonsense. He doesn't even believe what he's saying. And it actually hardens people's cynicism. So I think that, you know, modeling courage is really important. And we're not talking about like running into burning buildings courage. We're just talking about, you know, taking some risks. Um, so I think that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that my hunch is that in the course of people's lives, they have been um, more courageous than they might think that there have probably been things that they have done in their life that have required courage. And if you get people to think about that, if you get people to look for those kinds of bright spots in their own life and reflect on that, that might help, actually. Um, and so I think, that's, I think that's a big part of it. Um, and and I, I think that the other thing is that, you know, I think a role of, of um, you know, a, you know, as you're doing is, is, you know, a role of college is to encourage people to take those kinds of risks and be a little bit more courageous. So if you t create some space in your own instruction, your own class where people can be courageous, and it sounds like you're doing that, uh, you know, then you think you have, then, then I think you have a chance. And the fourth is, um, I don't know if you've seen any of the work by Brene Brown about vulnerability. Sure. And, and, you know, I mean, I think that's pretty good stuff. And, you know, I think a lot of times when people are feeling vulnerable or lacking courage, they think, well, I must be the only one who's ever experienced this emotion. I must be the only one who's ever been scared. I must be the only one who everybody else is going through and plunging into the great unknown. And here am I, like a little bit nervous about doing it. And that's just not the case. And so if they realize that other people are thinking that, 
uh, it beca- they feel like less of an outlier. So, I, I, you know, again, I don't think those are, you know, it's not, it's not systematic, but I think some of those principles might help a little. We talk a lot about fear and taking risks with uh, the business students here. Uh, how many of you all have read Julian Smith's The Flinch? Are you familiar with that, Dan? No. Th- that was uh, one of Seth Godin's Domino Project books. Um, it's on the Kindle versions for, still for free out there on Amazon, but Julian mm-hmm. Smith, the flinch. And basically he's talking about similar things. You know, how do we get past the idea that, um, we're afraid of so many things, but in reality, most of those things really won't kill us. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that that's an important, somehow I lost your screen here. I think that's, I think we're still on this side. Yeah, no, I can, okay. I don't know what I did, but, um, can you guys see me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll just stare straight into the camera because I can't, uh-huh. cause I can't see you now. But I can hear you guys fine. Um, not totally forgot the question. Yeah. Uh, just on, on the whole idea of fear and taking risks, Julian Smith's The Flinch. A lot of right. the students have read that. We talk about that. But one of the fun or interesting things about The Flinch is that he gives you a number of exercises to try. Yeah. Like, like taking cold showers for a week. Uh, oh, my. Just, yeah, just to realize... You know, nobody wants to do that, but in the I end, don't want to do that. Yeah, but it won't kill you. So no, but he's no, got but various I, things like that. Yeah, so. yeah, no, because I yeah. So so no, I, I I think the idea that the the it won't kill you is is pretty important. Yeah. Um, and it sort of goes. I, I think it's connected conceptually to some of the research on buoyancy, in particular, permanent. Like our tendency is to say, you know, we fail. It's going to ruin everything. Right. And it doesn't ruin everything. And if you take a risk, it's probably not going to, you know, a, a smart risk. It's probably not going to destroy your life. And, you know, I think that one of the things that, that instructors can do is give students a little bit of a safe space to do that and just build up some of the muscle and scar tissue that might make it more likely that they'll do it, that they'll do it, um, that they'll do it again. Sure. Let's see. Landon, you had your hand up over here. Landon wants a uh, one-on-one counseling session with you, I think. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to uh, thank you for writing Johnny Bunko because I think that may have saved me from a lot of unnecessary oh, wow. things. Uh, I th- it, for one, at, right after reading it, I made a decision about an internship that I decided I wasn't going to do it because I'm not going to do something just because it it could get me into an, an entry level job that I don't want to do. <laughs> um, Good move, yeah. So <laughs> it it just one of those. It's uh, the book. It was really impactful for me. Great, uh, thanks. And I just wanted to thank you for that. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Um, I struggle a lot with even with being authentic and believing what I in what I'm selling and just um, wholeheartedly being bought into it. Uh, I still struggle with putting myself out there and saying like, "Here, buy my stuff, sell, mm-hmm. like buy into me," because um, I just don't want to be annoying. We have those friends that walk up and you know that they wholeheartedly believe in what they're selling, but you just like, oh, okay, like. <laughs> Walk the other yeah, direction. Yeah. How do you battle yeah. that? Like, I can wholeheartedly believe something, but I don't want to be that person where everyone's like, I know they have a heart for that, but I'm going to walk the other direction because I just don't want to talk to them. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that um, just by the nature of your question, you're not someone who's going to go too far on that. Um, you're not going to be one of those annoying, pushy, yakaholic kind of people. Um, because you're, and, and, and I think most of us, most of us aren't, I think yourself, I mean, by the nature of your question, you're self-aware to avoid that trap. I think that what you, what you need going back a little bit to Ross point, I, th- I think you need, you know, a, cur- you know, a little bit of courage to take a few more steps in that more assertive direction. And the way to do it again is to take small steps, you know, don't go, you know, you know, there's courage and there's courage. Um, you know, there is, if you're going to climb, if you want to say, I want to climb Mount Everest, you don't start with Mount Everest, you know, you start climbing some smaller mountains first, so you know how to do it. And so what I would suggest to you is just a few things where you have to just sort of, where you have the courage to be a little bit more assertive, I guess is the word I'm looking for in other kinds of circumstances. So what does that mean? That means doing something, you know, I'm more introverted than extroverted, so I struggle with this too. Um, one of the things I've gotten a little bit better at is say if I'm in a situation where people don't know each other, okay, so a conference or you know a place where hey, everyone's kind of uneasy, is that you know overcome the um, overcome the uh, discomfort and overcome the discomfort and 
uh, you just introduce myself to somebody. And the first couple of times, it's kind of, it's hard. It feels a little freaky. But then you get a little bit better at it, and you realize, like, the world doesn't end. People don't, like, start laughing at you. They don't rip off your head, you know. And, and you get, you know, you try it once, and it's uncomfortable. You try it a second time, it's uncomfortable. You try it a third time, it's less uncomfortable. You try it a fourth time, it's a lot less uncomfortable. And then it becomes no big deal, you know? And so you become a little bit more. But it doesn't mean, you know, you go from being a little bit reticent to immediately saying, I'm going to become the life of a party. The next party I go to, I'm going to go grab the lampshade. I'm going to dance karaoke the whole time. <laughs> you know, you just don't go that far. You take a small, you have the courage to take a small step in the direction that you want. And once you do that, you start building up the wherewithal to do it again. And then you build up the world to do it again and you do it a bit away wherewithal to do it again but you don't change your fundamental nature you just become you know a slightly better version of yourself we've got time i think for one more okay okay so scott looks like you win looking back at yourself um as a college student or this age what is some some advice that what's the biggest advice that you wish you had that you didn't get it's a good question too and you know i mean you know i, I if i think back to me when i rise up when i was maybe 20 or 21 i probably even if i got good advice i probably wouldn't have listened to it i was too dumb to listen to it mm-hmm. so assuming that i were smarter i mean i <laughs> assuming i was smarter um, what I would have done is actually very consistent with this. Um, I actually, this is kind of weird because not, maybe it's not weird. I'll, I'll just say, uh, I actually would have worked harder. Um, um, I would have worked harder than I did and I work reasonably hard, but I still would have worked even harder because it's such an amazing opportunity and you learn so much through hard work. So I would have worked harder. And the second thing I would have done to your point is I would have taken more risks. Um, you know, I would have done some more unusual things, uh, put myself out there a little bit more. So, um, you know, and so, and, and, and you don't want to be, you know, and it, it really is an important point here and just in general in life is that you don't want to get to a point, you know, late in your life. And I hope that I'm not late in my life. Um, but, you know, I, you know, you don't want to get to a point later in your life when you have a lot of regrets. That's just no way to live. And a lot of times if you look at, and there's some good research on this, um, there's a guy named Pilmer, P-I-L-L-E-M-E-R. Uh, I can't think of the name of the book, but he he's a he's a sociologist at Cornell University, and you know he did some work, you know, looking to people, talking to people, and you know, very very you know, relative very old people, you know, like eighties or nineties, um, about their lives and and things, and you know what they what they t- what what people consistently say is that when they get you know older, much older, even older than I am, the, the regrets that they have are are not regrets. I took too many risks. I tried too many interesting things. Their regrets are I played it too safe. I didn't have enough courage. I didn't try enough new things. I didn't take enough risks. And so um, uh, I think that's, you know, I, I think it, for me, myself, you know, I, I think it would be, I think when I was 20, I, I might have, uh, if, if, that, if, that re- if, that, if that suggestion were presented to me by, by someone who I trusted, who I respected, I, maybe I would have moved a little bit more in that direction, uh, but in, looking at my life through that lens, I'm you know, and I'm I'm nearly fifty, so I you know, I, so twenty when I was twenty, um, I'm uh, you know, that's like thirty years ago. That's a long time ago, and you know, I, when I look at that period, when I look at that period, I said, oh, come on, you know, you could have taken a few more risks. You could have worked a little bit harder. You could have wasted a let. You could have wasted a little less time um, because you're not you know you're not here forever. So. Um, that, so I think it's a, you know, I think it's a really, and I, and I think, um, um, I think it's a great question to ask other people. I mean, I think it's a great question for all of you to ask people who are twice your age or beyond. Um, what do you wish you knew when you were my age? I think it's a fantastic question. Let me close with this then for a nearly 50 year old. What do, what does taking risks look like for you now? Uh, buying a Harley. <laughs> uh, I got a guy I can hit, set yeah, you up yeah. with over here. <laughs> uh, well, um, well, I mean, I, you know, I'm trying to. So what I'm what I'm doing is uh, actually for the second half of this year, I'm taking a sabbatical. I'm not working. Um, I, I'm basically doing something that I didn't have the guts to do before, which is that I'm I'm unplugging and I'm not doing I'm not traveling for work or my regular work. 
I'm not writing anything. Um, unfortunately, I'm not earning any money. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm taking six months to sort of say, okay, what's it about? What do I want to do? Um, can I make strategic choices rather than just go through the motions and, or just sort of go with inertia and muscle memory? Um, so, you know, so that's a little bit of a risk, I guess, of taking six months to basically stop and rethink what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that's what a risk looks like. Um, I think that's a little bit what a risk looks like uh, these days. Are you following Stefan Sagmeister's lead there? Totally. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good for you. Pardon? Oh, uh, Ben wanted Ben the Harley guy wanted to know if there was going to be a book following after the six months. Uh, Dan, probably not. Dan no, Pink's sabbatical really, experience. No, no, no. I'm not going to write a book about the sabbatical experience. No, I mean it's. I mean, unless you know, I don't know. Maybe if I something extraordinary happens, you know, I get okay. you know, you know, abducted by aliens. Um, okay. I mean, that'd be an awesome book. But you know, <laughs> leaving. Uh, le no, 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 no. It's really, it's really a case of saying, of, of actually being a little bit more deliberate and saying, okay, you know, what is it that I want to do next? What is it that I can contribute? What is it that I will find meaningful? And can I push beyond what I've done already to do some different things in different ways that also make a contribution? Okay, very cool. Well, thanks so much for your time today. We appreciate thanks for having me. your fun. generosity with that. And uh, students, real quick here, you won't be able to probably hear this, but we'll just say thank you anyway. Thanks, guys. Wish you well with the sabbatical and look forward to seeing what happens after that. All right, guys. Thanks. Thank Have you, a good Dan. Day.